We continue with our coverage of the COVID catastrophe taking place in our country. What is unfortunate is that on one hand you have unabashed gatherings, weddings of Neta's sons, Pumbh Mela and Shahi Snan, election rallies from Telangana to West Bengal, election preparation in Uttar Pradesh for the Panchayat polls and crowding, no social distancing, no mask, all of that continues. But on the other side is the India that is crumbling under the COVID catastrophe. The India, the people are gasping for breath. The people are fighting for oxygen, fighting for a hospital bed, a ventilator, even an RT-PCR test, an ambulance, have nowhere to go, are running from one place to the other, begging for help. That's the other reality in our country. And I want to take you through some of these stories today. These stories aren't just from the national capital or the big metro and capital cities. These stories go beyond the usual Mumbai, Delhi, Bengaluru, Kolkata conversation that we have. These stories are from the rest of the India where the situation is as bad as it is in our big cities. And these are the small towns where you don't have a strong healthcare infrastructure. So imagine the plight, the pain, the struggle. Let me give you some of those stories in the special edition. Visuals coming in from Noida, where the relatives of a patient were relentlessly pleading for the life-saving drug Remdesivir. And out of sheer helplessness, these women who were pleading in front of an official had their hands folded, even went ahead and touched the feet of the official, the chief medical officer of Noida begging and pleading for that drug to be provided. That's the desperation. It's all right for us to say Remdesivir is no magical drug that fixes your life problems. But for people whose loved ones are on the bed and in a serious condition, and for the people who've been told that you need to get this drug from wherever you can, this is the reality. Let me give you one more example, a horrific one coming in from Maharashtra's Bid district. 22 bodies of COVID casualties stuffed into one ambulance. 22 in the one ambulance taken to the crematorium for their last rites. Images will show you how Bodies covered in bags were stashed one above the other in this ambulance. Now, it's, it's painful, gut-wrenching. It will also make you angry. It's triggered a lot of outrage. But keep in mind, it's in a place like Beer, where there won't be enough ambulances to take on the toll that it is looking at right now. Here's another example for another part of our country. An 18-month-old baby passed away in an ambulance as a family rushed her from one hospital to another in Vishakhapatnam looking for a bed. The 18-month-old had been diagnosed with COVID. The family was told by two hospitals they don't have beds. Even the hand oxygen pump in the ambulance wasn't enough. After 90 minutes of waiting in the ambulance, we lost that baby. This in a place like Vishaka Patnam. In Bihar, in Gopal Ganj in Bihar, a man died in his wife's arms after he failed to get any treatment at the district hospital. Bihar has a few, very few handful dedicated COVID hospitals. It's also a state with really poor healthcare infrastructure, not a new thing. But even as the doctors of the Sadar Government Hospital were on a strike, this family struggled. They were in the hospital, running from pillar to post, to find a bed as the patient was showing serious COVID symptoms. The man eventually succumbed due to lack of treatment. So not only is there poor health infrastructure, in this case, the medical staff was on strike. I have more stories and I want to tell you each one of them. This is the story of the COVID catastrophe in India across the country. But Vinay Tiwari, our managing editor, also joins us. When I often we talk about cities like Mumbai and Delhi, 
uh, and you know even Chennai or Bengaluru or uh, Ahmedabad and Calcutta where the infrastructure is supposed to be slightly better. But what about the other towns where they don't even half the time have basic? Absolutely. And I think that's possibly the, if anything could got, get more frightening in this whole catastrophe that is upon us currently, uh, I think it is the realization uh, that this problem is not just restricted to the five or six big metros, but the crisis has now reached the interiors of India, the small towns. And every single day, uh, there are dozens and dozens of instances and videos and information that is coming in from small towns of sheer horror stories. Uh, I'll give you a small example, Tanvi. Some of the examples we are going to be putting out in the next 15 minutes or so but there are some that we have not been able to include uh, and we've heard about them or at least we are verifying some of them is in Gaya, for instance, uh, in the last one hour or so, I've heard of instances where people are simply bringing uh, people who are terminally uh, unwell or in the last stages and leaving them in the hospital and going back. They're so scared uh, and they're so worried uh, that they can't even take care of their own loved ones. Uh, there is an instance in Agra that happened a short while back where uh, a person is seen on a video begging the cops who have come to, along with a truck to replace oxygen cylinders. Uh, he is repeatedly falling at the feet of the police officers, begging him, saying that his mother uh, is, needs oxygen desperately and if they can quickly arrange and get some oxygen for his mother who's inside that hospital. Uh, and every single day, and I can guarantee you, uh, Tanvi, anybody who's watching this show tonight, uh, and, uh, on their WhatsApp groups, uh, each person would be getting such horror tales or, or cries for help from people who are literally running from pillar to post, not knowing what to do uh, and, and showing up sheer desperation. The two instances you mentioned about Noida, where people are seen touching the feet of the local uh, government official, uh, is, is probably the biggest uh, shame we could have brought upon ourselves. And I'm using the word shame because it's a price we are paying for having absolutely never regarded healthcare as something that is critical and it's important. And in that sense, uh, it's the small cities in India uh, and the cities outside of the metro big cities in, cap in, in the state capitals, uh, which are possibly going to get the brunt of it. And, 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 and I hope, and I really hope uh, that governments across the country, not just one state, it's not just one party, understand that this is not the time to show our worst sides, but to show our best sides in a crisis and not go into this frantic, uh, you know, scramble to hide information, hide deaths, hide cases, not allow testing, not allow any information to get out. That's not the way you will be able to solve this problem. Deaths can't be hidden. Every neighborhood knows who died next to their house and every loved one knows if they have lost someone in the family. It's a, it's a crisis of unimaginable levels and we are seeing a complete loss of empathy and sometimes even a dereliction uh, that is going on in many parts, especially the smaller towns than we. Yes, and, and, and whenever, you know, th this is a country where even in non-COVID times, in normal times, we get stories uh, where, you know, uh, uh, dogs are roaming around inside government hospitals, um, you, uh, eating off the bodies. We've had instances, horror stories coming in from how one patient was kept uh, on his own limb, the limb that had been cut off, cut off that was used uh, as a support for his head and kept there on a stretcher and people lying everywhere on the floors, uh, sharing beds, sometimes with dead bodies. That's the, that's the reality of our healthcare infrastructure, Vinay. Uh, and, and to now add the COVID stress to this, I mean, uh, do you even blame the authorities? What do you say at such a time? What can be expected of them when in normal times as well, we continue to ignore healthcare as if it doesn't matter? So it's actually very simple, uh, Tanvi, to see the patterns. And I'm hoping that people can get out of their clutter of over-information and see things very simply. If you observe COVID and, and the, the current surge in India is not restricted. I mean, of course, there are some states that are worse than the others, but it is now a national phenomenon. You have every state that is, that is showing a rise, including even northeastern states, which in the first uh, you know, COVID wave were not as badly affected as the rest of the country. Uh, but here is the game. A, all states who have a superior or a better health infrastructure are showing lesser instances of the extent of the misery. Uh, pretty obviously, a case count of this size will not be able to, we will not be able to manage it in any state possibly. You may not be able to provide something to everybody if the numbers just go beyond a level. 
But clearly in this crisis, you can see that any state whose infrastructure is, is, has been successively better over the years has been able to deal with the crisis better than the others. And if you see the states that are actually collapsing are the ones where the basic health infrastructure has been abysmally poor uh, for decades. Uh, that is part A. Part B, now let's assume that even if there are states where the crisis is, is unfolding and they don't have good infrastructure, what's the way out? Now, one way out, of course, is to come up with innovative solutions and rope in more people. Maybe even the armed forces are required. But there is also something that doesn't cost much, but it can be done pretty uh, easily, which is to show some empathy to people. Uh, I don't see how supplying cogent information on a round-the-clock basis is something that difficult for the administration of the size and the strength of the administration that exists in the states. Uh, India has a very large bureaucracy, state governments have a large number of officers, you have resources at your command, you have laws at your command. Uh, surely a simple thing of providing information to people on where to go can help save lives as well. A lot of people are simply dying because they're going from hospital to hospital looking for help. Uh, if they knew in advance that this is the hospital where they can go and know that in time, possibly they'll be able to save their loved ones. So it's a question of minimizing the misery. Nobody can ever say that the misery can be ended by a government, but certainly it can be minimized. But what you're seeing in, in, in contrast is not just a fact where there is no empathy, but sometimes even a completely different approach to it by coercion or by threat or by actually trying to force people not to complain. That is not the way in which this crisis will ever get solved because viruses and pandemics don't stop just because you issue a degree by law. Uh, even if you threaten somebody with an FIR, the virus is not going to stop. The virus will still come and hit you, communities will still go down, and people will still fall ill, and some may even fight, die. Uh, and the biggest uh, misery that we are watching is not just the fact that the hospitals are not able to take the load at all, and states don't have infra, but the sheer insensitivity sometimes that we are displaying in the way we are passing information and enabling citizens to get health, better health care, even if it is at a distance from where they are. I think people are willing to travel distances, they're willing to spend money, they're even willing to go to another state, but they just don't have information. And they're scrambling around, looking at all information from WhatsApp groups or social media or wherever else they can, and literally it's a hit and miss. Okay, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Vina. In fact, I just want to give some more examples. I mean, and as difficult as it is to present these stories, it's the reality of the COVID catastrophe in our country. A story of apathy coming in from Bhind in Madhya Pradesh, where a, where a woman who couldn't get admission in the hospital delivered her baby outside at the gate of the hospital. The hospital was demanding that she show uh, a RT-PCR uh, certificate, a COVID negative report, uh, which is a rule in most places. Even for non-COVID treatments, you need to be tested for COVID. But obviously, a woman who's gone into labor at that time is not going to be able to arrange it. And especially in a scenario like today, where our testing labs are so overburdened that test reports are taking uh, three days to one week to come. And because the hospital didn't take her in on the basis of no report, she was forced to deliver outside the gate of the hospital. Here's another incident coming in from Ludhiana. Dead bodies of several COVID patients were seen being transported to crematoriums in autos and rickshaws. This as the relatives of the deceased alleged that the ambulances were trying to fleece them by asking them for 3,005 rupees each to transport the body. In many, many big cities, we've also reported the same thing. Ambulances charging 12,000, 15,000 rupees at a time of crisis when they know there is a higher demand, not enough ambulances. That's what they're doing. And in this case, people had to use autos and rickshaws. So similar stories we got from Lucknow earlier where the uh, two sons had to carry their mother's dead body on a cycle rickshaw. Speaking of Uttar Pradesh, in Johnpur district, an old man was seen carrying his wife's corpse on a bicycle for cremation. This after the villagers refused to allow the cremation as the wife had succumbed to COVID. He had no choice but to carry the body on a cycle. And you can see the struggle right there in those pictures. Finally, the Johnpur police came to rescue and helped in arranging a cremation at a different place. Meanwhile, in another place in Uttar Pradesh, in Firozabad, a COVID patient's body was carried on a motorbike by her father after no ambulance was available or provided by the government hospital. The family alleged that the hospital didn't provide the ambulance after the death of the patient. A story that will actually come from town after town from many parts of our country where people have waited for hours for an ambulance and then fed up, have carried it in their own arms, 
on cycle rickshaws, on bikes and cycles, taken to the crematorium and then waited for days as well. 12 hours, 24 hours, 2 days, that's the kind of wait we are actually seeing in crematoriums right now. I want to move on and give you another horrific side of what's unfolding as a COVID catastrophe impact. And that's people losing their patience. People who've lost somebody or whose, uh, whose relative is extremely serious now getting angry, frustrated and unfortunately taking it out on the medical staff. There was high drama that prevailed at Jodhpur's MDM hospital after relatives of COVID patients created ruckus. The hospital was actually forced to call in the police to help protect the medical staff present there. That's one example. We had another example which came from Bakpat in Uttar Pradesh where the health department team that had gone to isolate COVID positive patients in a village, in, a, in the Kirtal village, were attacked by the local villagers who refused to allow patients to be taken by them. One of the team members or medical team members was attacked by sharp objects and the testing kits were also smashed by the locals. Yesterday we had a story from the national capital Vinay that came in from southeast Delhi, one of the biggest hospitals, Apollo Hospital. And it was, I mean, those visuals are scary and I can only imagine the plight of the medical fraternity inside that hospital when they saw what was unfolding, the kind of chaos and violence that was there. Absolutely. In fact, there was another instance, uh, uh, Tanvi, which came in from Gujarat, where a firing was opened because the fight broke out over oxygen cylinders, uh, you know, between a group of people who were standing outside in a queue. Uh, look, grief and misery can have many outlets and sometimes anger is one outlet that does happen when you're in extreme grief and you're completely helpless and that's pretty much what we're seeing. In fact, I think today when we did a check in the last couple of days itself, we've noted some 18 or 19 instances uh, where it's become a civil unrest issue, something that we had feared. Uh, and when you have a shortage of this level, when you have misery of this level and more than that, when you have absence of information or even an attempt to help, I think most people, even in their gravest of crisis or gravest of difficulty, appreciate sincerity. Uh, when you see that somebody is sincerely making an effort to help, even if the help is coming late or it is not coming as much as you, as you want, but there is an effort, there is sincerity in the effort, uh, people are a little more understanding of that. I think the trouble is that in the current crisis, you see a lot of situations where there is no sim sincerity in the efforts uh, that is getting reflected on the ground. And that is leading to greater anger amongst people because if you lose your loved one, you cannot rational, r rationalize or, or, or reason right. out uh, anything with that person. Of course, nobody is allowed to take law and order in their own hands. Uh, but then these are people who are suffering from intense grief, Tanvi. Right. Absolutely. In my, you know, in some cases, when a hospitals have gone to court seeking security as well because they fear such kind of law and order situations, one hopes it doesn't come to that. Thank you, Vinay, for joining us. Completely out of time on this edition of Urban Debate. Thank you, viewers.